This is an American soldier at the top of the world on the Greenland ice cap. He is by no means alone out here. Spread across this mighty ice cap are many other soldier and civilian scientists, engineers, technicians, and support troops. They are all probing the mysteries of the Arctic wastes. You may well wonder what Americans are doing in this polar wilderness of ice and snow. A glance at a globe of the world, however, will readily show that the shortest air route from the Americas to Eurasia is over the North Pole. It is imperative that we push the outpost line of defense of the free world far to the north in the very shadow of the pole itself. Our active military interest in the lands above the Arctic Circle began in 1950 when it became apparent that communist strategy was to step up the Cold War to hot war aggression in Indochina and Korea, a policy which brought quick reaction in the free world. The polar regions became a major strategic area. But little was known of this mysterious land of the midnight sun. Until recent times, the northern part of Greenland was a total unexplored wilderness. It was not until 1909 that Admiral Robert E. Perry electrified the world by his conquest of the North Pole from an advance base in North Greenland. And in 1910, the Danish explorer Nude Rasmussen established a trading post at Thule, a name derived from the Romans meaning the ultimate ends of the earth. These hardy early explorers live like the native Eskimos. Their homes, native tents. Their food, seal blubber. Their clothing, the skins and furs of native animals. Their transportation by dog sled. Or on foot. The scant records of the pioneers gave few answers to the military planners who were faced with the need to fight endlessly for bare survival. They pondered a host of questions on how to establish and maintain modern armies with a vast complex of supplies and equipment on the Greenland ice cap. The famous polar flyer, Colonel Bernd Balchen, fortunately recalled that Rasmussen had mentioned that the Thule area would be suitable for a polar air base if such were ever needed. A survey of the Thule district showed the soundness of Rasmussen's suggestion. American ingenuity was called upon to design and build a mighty air base at Thule which could handle our largest aircraft. Greenland is part of Denmark. The Danish government was glad to cooperate in this important step to move the free world's line of defense northward. And an agreement was soon reached between the governments of Denmark and the United States. Overcoming tremendous problems of polar construction and survival, and with the close cooperation of the Danish government, industry went into high gear in the country's defense. In record time, the largest secret amphibious operation since D-Day in Normandy smashed through the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean to within 800 miles of the pole. The ships dropped anchor in North Star Bay at Thule, Greenland. Army engineers and the Transportation Corps went to work in an around-the-clock stevedoring operation. Dirt flew in all directions as quarries were dynamited for material to construct airstrips and roads. Crews worked in shifts around the clock 
during the Arctic summer daylight when the sun never sets. For example, these pictures were taken at two o'clock in the morning. Thus, the mighty air base grew like magic out of the eternally frozen landscape. In 104 days of continuous labor, Thule was operational. The mortal remains of nude Rasmussen, which lie at the summit of Mount Dundas, must indeed have marveled. With the Thule Air Base a reality, the scientists and support troops flew in. First order of business, a complete polar outfit. For out on the ice cap, man does not survive long without the proper clothing in the often 60 degrees below zero temperatures of an Arctic blizzard. These felt boots protect the feet against frostbite in the crisp, dry air of the Greenland ice cap, where it never rains. A rainy day in New York, however, would turn them into clammy mush. In the grim shadow of the glowering edge of the ice cap, about 14 miles inland from Thule, a primitive base was established called Camp Tuto, meaning Thule takeoff. From Camp Tuto, the first dangerous probes of the ice cap began. Never before had heavy vehicles ascended the cap or attempted to travel over its rugged surface. Crevasses, many of them camouflaged by a deceptive bridge of snow, were an ever-present danger. They varied in size from shallow cracks in the ice to massive ice caverns as large as a cathedral. A lead group gingerly tested the trail. The drivers warily steered their vehicles by remote control. Helicopters went scouting ahead for a relatively free crevasse area. This Rube Goldberg-like contraption is an electronic crevasse detector. A safe trail through the dangerous crevasse area was located and marked with colored flags. The crevasse area extended some 60 miles from the edge of the ice cap. After that, the mighty ice blanket was solid. All kinds of vehicles and equipment were designed and tested. No one could tell if they would work in this rugged environment until they were tried. Slowly, the dreaded ice cap gave up its age-old secrets. Like the wagon trains of the early west, mighty ice cap trains called heavy swings lumbered ever onward over the ice cap plains. This series of trailers on sleds, in which the crews worked and lived, are called wanigans. The pioneering of these heavy swings established new camps and airstrips within a few hundred miles of the pole itself. Forever threatening to crush the puny efforts of man in his conquest of the north was the unpredictable Arctic weather. The world's worst blizzards raged down from the pole to put a halt, sometimes for days, to all movement. Nothing to do about it, just wait it out. And when the storm's fury is expended, dig out and continue the journey. Equally feared with the polar blizzard is the threat of fire in this bone-dry climate. Constant fire drills are held to alert the troops to this danger.
Each year, as activities resumed during the summer season in Greenland, research and development increased greatly. Scientists studied everything from the sea-sculptured edge of the glaciers as they flowed to the sea, to the life and habits of the native Eskimos. As busy as the troops were, they could always find time to help out a sister service. In 1960, the Transportation Corps conducted the largest expedition to date. It was called Lead Dog, and an actress from the USO helped to give it a send-off. The plan was to cross the entire northern ice cap for the first time, a round-trip journey of over 1,800 miles, much of it over the same route followed by Perry on his historic journey to the pole. Now, over a half century later, other Americans, equipped with the latest developments of modern science, awaited the signal to start. The chaplain blessed their efforts. And the camp commander wished them a safe journey into the wilderness. The signal was given to move out, and Lead Dog was on its way to 26 days of travel over the majestic Greenland ice cap. Fuel caches had been stored along the trail the previous year. And airdrops showered supplies from the sky. The long, hard journey was relieved with some of the comforts of home, such as plenty of good chow. And movies, 700 miles from the North Pole. Yes, even a traveling PX. Along the way, scientific snow pit studies were made. Seismic studies revealed that the center of the ice cap is almost 10 times as deep as the Empire State Building is high. Twenty-six days after leaving Camp Tuto, Lead Dog arrived at Crown Prince Christian Land, to the surprise of the only inhabitants, the musk oxen. The expedition had spanned the entire northern half of Greenland. The scientists took full advantage of their short stay in this faraway land. One of the rich finds was the remains of an ancient Eskimo camp believed to be over 4,000 years old. Here in the centuries before Christ, men hunted and fished along the clear waters of the fjord. Research on the ice cap had progressed to the point where tactical exercises could be held. Exercise Arctic Night was an example of this type of operation.
In the land of Santa Claus, Christmas is not forgotten. Although this familiar White House Christmas tree would not last long in the winter gales of the polar latitudes, the ever-inventive GI spirit conjured up this sturdy replica made of iron pipes. Deep under the ice cap, in a tunnel used to study glacier movement, an enterprising GI sculptured an altar of ice where services of the three major faiths have been held. Because the below freezing temperature in the ice tunnel varies so little, the altar does not melt. On Easter morning, as the first rays of the rising polar sun light up the frozen landscape, divine services are held. Surely one of the most moving and unique sunrise services in the world. After experimenting with under ice structures, the Army Corps of Engineers were determined to build Camp Century. It was to be a self-contained base under the ice cap, 800 miles from the pole, that would be immune to the raging storms on the surface. In the months it took to build the city under ice, more than 6,000 tons of equipment and supplies were required. They were hauled 138 miles over the ice cap to the site. A three-day journey in all degrees of weather. Peter Snow plows imported from Switzerland chewed their way into the ice cap. Roofs were constructed of overlapping steel arches. These were then covered with snow. Because the snow plows milled the snow, it soon froze into a cement-hard surface. Buildings were prefabricated in the United States and came complete down to the last nail. There was no sending out to a local hardware store if a hinge were missing. To provide power at Camp Century, a portable nuclear power plant was shipped to Greenland. This project aroused keen interest in private industry since it provided a practical field test of the reliability and safety of a nuclear power plant in a populated area. Arriving at Camp Century Greenland all the way by land, sea, and ice cap from Buffalo, New York, the massive components were moved into position deep under the ice. The whole camp was anxiously standing by, waiting for the moment when the nuclear power plant would go critical or fail. Success, and with it the magic of the atom, supplying light, heat, and power to the city under ice. Thanks to Army ingenuity, the men at Camp Century live exactly as do other soldiers at more conventional army camps. Except for the fact that they have no windows, their quarters are modern, spacious, and comfortable. Despite its harsh remote location, USO units fly in to entertain the garrison. The melody maids help to defrost the deep freeze. In their off-duty hours, the men do what they can to amuse themselves with the recreation opportunities at hand.
one of the most popular off-duty activities is talking to the folks at home through the facilities of the amateur radio service. Ably supporting the ground troops and scientists is the Army Aviation Branch. Their many duties include piloting scientists and soldiers to the various camps on the ice cap. They also fly in the welcome and eagerly awaited mail. Survey and mapping teams rely on the helicopters to airlift them to otherwise inaccessible locations and high peaks. An emergency air ambulance service is another vital function of the Army Aviation Branch. Even in the remote frozen wilderness of North Greenland, military traditions are maintained. A Fourth of July ceremony is held annually. After three years of successful operation at Camp Century, the nuclear power plant was dismantled and relocated in the United States. Despite the dangerously high radiation in the reactor system, the operation was conducted without incident. This was the first time in history that a nuclear power plant had been installed, operated, and relocated to a new site. Valuable lessons learned in this project were made available to private industry. A prime example of how Army research contributes to a better future for all of us. The unique nature of the Army's mission in Greenland attracts important visitors from abroad. Lord Shackleton, Minister for Air Great Britain, toured the ice cap facilities and Prince Nude of Denmark recently paid a state visit to the land his brother rules. The shorter days and increasing storms warn of the approach of the sunless winter. Although the polar winter calls a halt to military research on the ice cap, the constant job of digging out, 
housekeeping chores, and servicing vehicles and equipment for the next summer season of activities, takes up much of the time of the caretaker troops. But the long winter will end. And as sure as the summer sun shall rise again, dedicated men will always be ready to brave any perils, overcome any hardships in the defense of freedom. Whether it be threatened in the steaming jungles at the equator or the frozen wilderness at the summit of the world.